Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Joseph Parker. I have a doctorate of medicine, uh, which I got about 17 years ago, and I've been practicing medicine. Prior to that, I was an Air Force officer in command of Minuteman II ICBMs, which made me interested in both rockets and radiation, since we were the target for several of the Soviet ones. Um, we're looking at human radiation exposure tolerance and expected exposure during the colonization of the moon and Mars. The reason it's such a lengthy title is that was my thesis for my master's degree. I got a little bored and just finished a master's degree in aerospace science. Um, we're going to be looking at who will be the first settlers to these areas, what will they face, and who should we select to go. Not everyone has the same resistance to radiation. Uh, there are different age groups and sexes that are uh, have a very variable uh, cumulative resistance to the effects of radiation. So right now we have several private national organizations that are planning to go to, my thesis was on the moon and Mars, I'm going to focus on Mars. Um, to, to go to Mars to establish a colony or a base and as far as Elon Musk is concerned, a permanent city. I mean, a, a new planet for humans to expand to. NASA has the uh, Senate launch system with the Orion capsule. China has said that they plan to go, um, and they're making some pretty neat things. You know, they're putting up some space stations, uh, doing things the Soviets did quite a bit ago, but they're still doing it very rapidly. They, have a, they had a lander on the moon, as you know, and it is their stated intent to colonize the moon. I mean, there's, they, and there are a few benefits to an authoritarian government, but getting everything going in one direction is, uh, is one of them. It's very easy for them to say this will happen in 12 years, and it will happen in 12 years. Our political lifespan is four to eight years. Um, Mars One and SpaceX are the two private organizations right now that are planning to go. SpaceX is developing the capability to go. Mars, X is, uh, Mars One is selecting people that it plans to send on someone else's hardware. Okay. Several of the things they will face, cramped quarters, isolation, they will have communication delay between four to 28 minutes depending upon the orbits of the two planets. Even a four minute delay is very frustrating and makes it easier to send little video chats or, or text messages than it does to actually carry on a conversation. This also means that when you're on the surface of Mars, I'm certain that one of the astronauts to go there in that first crew will have a doctor on board someone who's at least skilled in general surgery or emergency medicine, which is what I practice, I'd like to go. But if something comes up that that doctor cannot handle, if you need a surgical procedure, you have some serious internal injury, it will not be done remotely. There is no way to remotely man one of the Da Vinci robots, which is the, the, the French uh, robotic system, the European robotic system that does wonderful surgeries. You can't man that with a four to 28 minute delay. If an artery starts bleeding, you can't clamp it four minutes later. You definitely can't clamp it 28, well you can clamp it 28 minutes later, but it's not very effective. <laughs> they will also face, unless they have some form of artificial gravity. Um, as Dr. Zubrin elucidated, he plans to spin the capsule and provide some form of gravity. I wanted to ask him, does he plan to do that at 1G or at, at what would be Mars gravity, or do you want to start at 1G and slowly transition to Mars gravity as you get there so everyone's not uh, bumping their heads on the habitat when, when they land? Um, the other thing is osteoporosis. Bones get very weak as you travel through space without, without gravity. Muscles atrophy. And there's also the risk of radiation injury, as poor Spock found. Um, one thing that hasn't really been discussed are genetic ways to ameliorate the bone and muscle loss. There's a condition called osteosclerosis which causes abnormal thickening and strengthening of the bone. They found this when people were hit by cars and should have suffered multiple fractures and had no fractures at all. It's a ge genetic condition that makes your bones extremely strong. Using CRISPR and other, other genetic 
methods they have, you could turn on that gene and cause someone's bones to not break down. You can also give a vaccine that inhibits myostatin. Uh, Google that and you will see a dog that looks like Hercules, it's crazy. Um, when you inhibit my myostatin is the protein that makes our muscles disappear. It's why our ancestors survived and the Neanderthals did not. They had three times our muscle mass, but their gene was not as active as ours. So our ancestors shrunk down to about the size of your thumb and made it through a bottleneck where about 50 females survived. They all died. Three times our body mass means about 6,000 calories a day. And there is evidence in one cave that they ate some of us, so we weren't, we weren't fast enough. Um, but radiation is what we're going to be mainly looking at. Now there was an excellent talk earlier about radiation and she described it probably better than I can. The radiation dangers, the main problem is ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation means that it knocks an electron off an atom. Atoms covalently bond to other atoms to form molecules. These molecules are incredibly important. Well, they're what make us up. Um, if the molecule gets broken apart, it becomes non-functional. Important molecules like DNA, when they break apart, you get a dysfunctional cell. If you're lucky, if it's, if it's had severe injury to its DNA, some minor injury can be repaired. There's a bacterium called radioferrins that can live in nuclear reactors. They need to study how and see if there's something they can modify humans for so we can have better radiation repair, because it doesn't mind all that radiation. However, humans do. When the DNA is damaged, if it is damaged severely, the cell will detect this injury and undergo something called apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. It will take itself out. If it does not do that, it can become cancerous. All cancer is caused by damage to DNA, either through viruses, with some of them, or through radiation, or through chemicals, or just in transcription errors as cells are multiplying and being copied. Now, when cells are multiplying, their DNA is unrolled like a big scroll. When a skin cell is deciding what to do, everything is rolled up except what it needs to be a skin cell. So when a cell is dividing is when it's at its most vulnerable. That's why rapidly dividing cells are injured first when you get undergo radiation uh, exposure. You can see apoptosis here, normal cell, cell dying. Cancer cell there. Cancer cells become free living organisms that don't care about you and your body doesn't recognize them as foreign. So they travel around your body eating up resources, invading your brain, and unless there's a good chemotherapy agent to take them out. Occasionally the body, it will express a protein that identifies to the body this is foreign and the body will wipe it out. That's why you get the 0.5 to 1% spontaneous remission even in, in incurable cancers like glioblastoma multiforme, which is a horrible type of brain cancer suddenly they get cured. All the tumors go away. And whatever that person was doing at that time, I guarantee you they will write a book about it. If they were juicing to save themselves, by gosh, the juice did it. If they went down to get latrol, it was latrol. You know, if they hung upside down in a bat cave, that's what did it. So, uh, the last slide, I didn't quite go into that. Nerve cells in the brain do not replace themselves very much. We used to think when I was in medical school 17 years ago, they didn't replace themselves at all, but that's not accurate. New cells are generated in the hippocampus and they migrate out and wire themselves in. That's why aerobic exercise and mental exercise will keep your brain young. Professors have died at the age of 90. They do an autopsy and they say, this guy has terrible Alzheimer's and no one knew. Because you can knock cells out of this network as long as they're replacing themselves and it takes aerobic exercise. I love lifting weights, but I have to run if I want to keep my brain young. Electromagnetic spectrum. Now, with ionizing radiation, we've got radio waves. They're about the size of buildings. They don't hurt anybody. Microwaves, they can heat you up, but they don't cause cancer. Um, infrared, now, radio waves, there's some argument. There was a recent thing in the paper about cell phones in your pants, near your goodies, saying don't do it. I don't know. I would wait for the, for the evidence to come out. That's not ionizing radiation. I would be very surprised if, if, if that was what was causing the sperm count drops. It might be the P BPA in, from all the plastic breakdown. Visible light is what we can see. And just past that is ultraviolet. Now, ultraviolet is the first wavelength of light that can cause serious harm to human beings and cancer. But it's not very penetrating. As you go further and higher in frequency, 
you get more and more penetration. X-rays can go through most of you, but not the bones. We can see you know, we can do a good X-ray on you. And then gamma rays will go through some of them six feet of lead. So they're a little harder to block. So types of radiation, particles with mass. Now, all electromagnetic radiation is photonic radiation. It has no rest mass. You stop a photon, it ceases to exist. If you have a particle with mass, electrons, protons, and helium nuclei, these things, imagine it's the difference between getting stabbed with an ice pick and getting hit with a baseball bat. You know, the, the ice pick goes straight through, causes a, a little, quite a bit of damage in one small area. The baseball bat can do a lot. So it's a little dim, but alpha particles can be stopped by a sheet of paper. They are the easiest to shield against radiation, but the deadliest if you ingest it. The Russian spy that was killed, probably by Putin, um, was given polonium-210. Polonium-210 gives off alpha particles. Alpha particles will wipe you out very quickly if they're inhaled. Radon gas being inhaled, bad idea. And just as an aside, there are some areas of Iran where the radon gas coming out from the natural hot springs produces a radiation environment equal to that of the surface of Mars. And people live there. Okay, beta rays are just high-speed electrons. These were, were named in the order that they were discovered and the scientists didn't understand them at that time. Alpha is helio, uh, helium nuclei, yeah, high speed. Beta particles are electrons and gamma rays are photonic radiation. Neutrons. Neutrons are mainly produced by secondary radiation. When a big massive particle, like a, a helium nucleus, hits part of your ship, especially metal, I used to think just put a bunch of lead around it. But it turns out that when these massive particles hit that shielding, it gives off secondary radiation of several different types, including neutrons. Neutrons are very, very bad for human beings. Antiparticles and very large nuclei are mainly from galactic radiation. Galactic radiation are supernova exploding and sending out all kinds of stuff, including iron atoms traveling at high speed. The very first astronauts noted that they would see flashes of light. None of them thought that, they, that the other guys were seeing it. They thought it was just them. They didn't want to say anything in case, in case they got taken off duty, right? So later they got down and they said, man, I kept seeing these flashes of light. And they were like, you too? Those were galactic uh, galactic ray particles or very heavy particles traveling through their brain, traveling through their retina, and as secondary radiation creating photons that their ret retina picks up as light. So that was, now a particle of iron traveling at very high speed will hit with the equivalent force of a baseball thrown at about 100 miles per hour. It is a tremendous amount of power in one atom. Secondary radiation, here you see a proton coming in, hitting an atom, changing that atom into something else, giving off gamma rays, beta rays, the deadly neutron. Secondary radiation, uh, we'll get into shielding in a minute. How is radiation measured? Several different ways to measure it, and that was one of the most confusing things when I started doing this research. They said, well, there's 84 rims, or there's 87 rads, and there's 198 sieverts, and uh, why can't you guys just get together and agree on what it should be? So I've done that for them. We're gonna use the international system. We're gonna use the sievert. Exposure, the amount of radiation traveling through the air. Dose, the amount that is absorbed by an object or person, dose equivalent. For dose, you have to wonder, well, what kind? Is it neutron? You know, is it gamma? G to know what it will do to that person. For dose equivalent, they say, okay, we take how much radiation you absorb and factor in what type it was and tell you how bad that is for you. And that's an excellent way to do it. So we'll be using the Siebert. Siebert is a measure of the amount of radiation absorption by the human body. It takes into account the relative biological effectiveness of ionizing radiation of all types. We'll be doing things in millisieverts, because a, a sievert is actually a big bad dose. Uh, one millisievert is equal to 10 ergs of energy, for you physicists, of gamma radiation transferred to one gram of living tissue. For beta and gamma radiation, the dose equivalent is the same as the absorbed dose. The dose equivalent is larger than the absorbed dose for alpha and neutron radiation, because these are more damaging to the human body. So how much radiation do we have in our environment as we're running around all the time, and how much is it safe to get? This is how much, this is the maximum occupational exposure. You're a uranium miner. How much radiation can you get before they tell you you can't work anymore? It's about 50 millisieverts. 
Now, natural levels in some areas of the mountains of Brazil are up around 12 millisieverts. Now, I told you Iran was 250. It's way up here. Some parts, not all of it. Average dose for hospital radiologists. They're snooty anyway. U.S. average total exposure, natural and industrial. Proposed limit on population average, non-occupational. So if it's not your job to work in a high radiation environment, in which case you can get this much, you're just the average person running around out there. They don't want you to have more than this much. That's a proposed limit. U.S. average natural exposure. Now what's a natural exposure? One thing that they don't factor in is coal-powered energy plants. Coal has mixed in with it thorium, uranium, other radioactive materials that when put into the air and you inhale is really, really bad for you. But the government and the politicians have decided that this is considered normal radiation. And the acronym is normally occurring radioactive materials. Well, they are normal in the ground. They're not normal in my lungs. So those are not factored in, and it's actually against the law for the EPA to spend its money tracking it. A coal-powered energy plant puts out a lot more radiation than a nuclear power plant. Not, not if the nuclear power plant is Chernobyl. This is a statutory limit on radiation from an operating power plant. And this is how much you get from x-rays and stuff. You can't even see it on my scale. So. If you had a choice between living next to a nuclear power plant or a coal-fired power plant, you'd do much better with the nuclear one until the sirens go off, in which case, have your car parked facing out. <laughs> Average levels of radiation exposure in these different environments that we're looking at. Okay. On Earth, the annual total radiation exposure, on average, is about three millisieverts. Mars is 245, the Moon is 438, Space 657. So space is 220 times Earth average. So one day in space is 220 days on Earth. The moon is 146 times, Mars 82 times. Now, why is the Earth so good? Well, we've got a thick atmosphere. It blocks most of the radiation. We also have a very strong magnetic field that helps with the galactic and solar radiation. Pilots get a bigger dose. They go up higher. Now, when you're in space, you're hit from all directions, and the only thing protecting you is this little suit. When you're on the moon, the moon itself blocks half that radiation. You're just getting a hemisphere worth plus quite a bit of secondary radiation because as the solar and galactic radiation strikes the moon's surface, secondary radiation comes up and gets you. So there is that. On Mars, you do have some atmosphere. If we were to consider the average atmospheric pressure on Earth, I think it's 960 millibars, but I like to remember 1,000. So I'll go a little feet, few feet below sea level or whatever to get an even 1,000. That's easier to remember. Mars is about 11 millibars, so 1,000 to 11. But it does block some of the radiation. Now, it doesn't have an ozone layer, so it's not going to block ultraviolet. So your plastics are going to break down faster. You'll get a good sunburn if you're not careful. And our atmosphere blocks almost all of it. You can't do gamma or x-ray um, astronomy from the Earth's surface. You've got to send those things up into space. Different shielding on the way to Mars. Now, you have to worry about the radiation you get on the way to Mars and the radiation that you get once you're there. Five minutes to go. Oh, my gosh. OK. Uh, aluminum shielding. Pretty good. Water shielding, not that great. Liquid hydrogen, really, really good. Uh, we won't even go into electromagnetic shielding. Regular shielding on Mars. You're going to have to bury your habitats to protect yourself from the radiation there. So here you are on Mars, getting ready to build the habitats for those to come so you can tell them how lazy they are and how much they should respect everything you did. When there is a solar flare, your radiation detector goes off and you run for shelter, sadly without your helmet. So your problems are worse than just radiation. <laughs> so, up to 2,000 millisieverts, nausea and vomiting. About 5,500, fever, bleeding, diarrhea, and death of about 50 to 90% of the crew. 10,000, and that's the one to remember, everyone's going to die within less than two weeks. 45,000, you're dead within one week. I don't, you know, it's kind of arbitrary there, but everybody's gone. One-year mission limits set by NASA. NASA is more generous than the European Space Agency and the Russian Space Agency. They both allow 1,000 millisieverts. NASA allows quite a bit more. But as you will notice, 
there is a big difference between males and females and age. At age 30, a male can receive 620. At age 55, 1,470. This data was derived from analyzing the evidence from Hiroshima and Nagasaki and saying who had 3% higher incidence of cancer and died sooner. So the age of exposure, the dotted line is 10 years old when you first get hit, and this is how, how, how far you made it, how long you lived. This is 30 years old when you first get hit. This is 50 years old when you first get hit. And this is excess deaths per 10,000. So when you're young, a lot of people die. When you're older, not that many die. And when you're really old, it really doesn't shorten your lifespan by very much. It doesn't have time to cause those cancers. So cumulative radiation limits for the different age groups divided by sex. I want to get to the good part. Has anyone already been selected to go to, Mar to Mars? Well, I looked at the Mars 1 100 selectees. And I analyzed them and found out that one man and one woman is 55 plus. Most of the people selected to go are 26 to 34. Some are less than 25. You send someone less than the age of 25 to Mars first without having shielded habitats built and you're going to have some rapidly dying people in not that many years. So I then analyzed it and said, well, how long if I factor in the radiation limits, the cumulative radiation limits that you're allowed to have according to NASA for their astronauts, and I say, how much radiation do you get on the way and how much radiation will you get per year there? I take how much you can receive, I subtract the voyage, I divide by the yearly radiation, and I get five and a half years that a, a man less than 25 can work, and 28 years that a man over 55 can work. And bear in mind, you're not going to have heavy construction equipment. You're going to be bearing these things in regolith by hand or with much smaller powered equipment than, uh, than we have here on Earth. Uh, for females, 1.7 years for the youngest, 20 years for the oldest. Uh, worst case scenario, now I used Mars 1's figures for how much radiation you'd get in on, on the way there and how much radiation there would be once you got there. This is the voyage, annual exposure. The youngest females that they plan to send would have less than six months on the surface before they would reach their cumulative radiation total and have to be in some sort of shielded habitat. And it, it takes a pretty thick habitat to shield you down to Earth normal levels. First colonists will be spending a lot of time on the surface building the shielded habitats for those to follow. Older colonists can work in high radiation environments for a longer period of time before reaching their limit of radiation exposure. First colonists to be sent to Mars should have no prior high radiation exposure. Uh, there should be no pilots. Should have already had any children they want and should be at least over the age of 45, if not 55. And Mars One should consider sending their oldest group of candidates first. Nothing wrong with an older crew. They usually get the job done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Please. Yes, I think it was yes. very interesting. Um, you know certainly the analysis of, uh, of Tsubri, who always says, and I said in my presentation yesterday, that radiation is not a real problem to take some letters. Are, are you sharing this? I have the impression, yes, but I would like yes. to hear your opinion. Radiation does not keep us from going to and colonizing Mars. To have the best possible outcome, older people go first, younger people come later. There is. There is a standardized, we know with a certain amount of radiation how much mutation that, that there will be over time, both to the, the, the cells in the body, the somatic cells, and to the gametes. It's a big deal. If you plan on having kids and you go there at 25 and your goodies are cooked for about 10 years before you have one, you may be, you may have the world's first Martian child. I mean, you're going to have, it would not be good. Can you separate uh, the damage due to ionizing radiation from other sources of mutations? No. No, they cannot. <coughs> I, uh, I live in an area with a lot of radon in the basement has to be evacuated. And uh, people have been exposed to that now for a very long period of 
period of time, is there any correlation of facts that you can ascertain for people who have lived in a high radon? Yes, radon is, radon gas exposure is very highly associated with lung cancer. Not other types of cancer, but lung cancer. So you're, in, you're inhaling a radioactive material into your lungs, the risk of lung cancer goes way up. And it is a, a very big risk. And the, the people in, uh, in Iran, they do have a higher incidence of lung cancer. You have non-smokers getting lung cancers in their 30s and 40s. Almost unheard of, except in very, very polluted areas or areas where there's lots of radon. I think that's all the time. Thank you very much.